For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we are indeed grateful to be here this morning, to be ending another year and beginning a new one. Father, we ask that your spirit will be present with us this morning as we are here worshiping you and that you will continue to be with us in the coming year and that your blessings will fall on each one of us, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Lomeland University Church Sabbath School, the final Sabbath of 2017. I don't know about the rest of you. I have no idea where the rest of the year went and how we got to this Sabbath so quickly, but it seems like the older we get, the faster the years go by. I'm not sure that I'm looking forward to the rest, but it is what it is. But welcome to the University of Church. Those of you who are watching online, on broadcast, we welcome you as well. I want to thank Aaron Lay for our song service this morning. Uh, Those of you who don't know Aaron, he's our church accountant, so he plays a very important role here at our church. Um, Been seeing him up front with music during camp meeting and so forth, but we appreciate his uh, help with our song service this morning. Our special feature is going to be brought to us by uh, Dr. Calvin Thompson. Used to be a pastor on our staff here. He's now with the School of Religion, teaching full time on the faculty there. And um, he's going to be talking to, to some degree about New Year's resolutions, but not in the way that we typically think of them. Uh, with a little bit of a different slant on it. 
Um, I, I have to give credit to my wife, Jeannie. In the bulletin, it says she's one of the superintendents, but she'll never get up in front here. She does all the organizing. She puts the programs together. I just have to get up here and do the talking, and we both think each other has the harder part to play. But I appreciate all the hard work that she puts into it, and uh, she wanted something that dealt with the new year, but not in the traditional way that we you know, make resolutions and so forth that we keep for a week or two or maybe a little longer. So that, that's kind of the emphasis we're going to be looking at today, and, and uh, Calvin will be talking some more about that. Our music is going to be brought to us by Emerald Wawarengdeng Long. She's going to be playing her harp. She is on the, the music faculty at Longland Academy. She teaches violin, harp, and I believe piano, if I remember correctly. Anyway, I've known Emerald for many, many years and uh, looking forward to hearing her, her music. And our lesson is going to be brought to us by no stranger, Miguel Mendez, with our pastoral staff here. He is uh, the pastor for spiritual development, and his title is, is Christian Living. And I should mention that, that Calvin's title for the special feature is The Year is New, But I Am Not. So again, I want to welcome you all to our Sabbath school, and I do pray that uh, each of us are blessed by being here today. When Jeannie Sample asked me if I would talk about New Year's resolutions and put a new spin on them, I immediately thought of the concept that came out in the title. Most of us discover that the year may be new, but we are not. And it doesn't take us long to discover that whatever it was that was part of us in the old year is still part of us in the new year. It isn't always easy to make changes, even though many people resolve to make changes when a new year comes. Do you know that nearly half of all Americans make New Year's resolutions? It's up from only about 25% at the time of the Great Depression. So there is an increase in resolutions. Do you know how, what percentage is estimated of people who succeed for the whole year in their resolutions? About 12%. So that kind of emphasizes the point we made earlier. So, um, we also, you know, a lot of interesting statistics about how New Year's resolutions play out, how successful they are. I had a little bit of fun looking at some of the resolutions people had made. Somebody said, I will eat all the junk food in my house so that it is no longer there to tempt me. Somebody said, I will remember to write 2018 instead of 2017 in all my checks. Now, that's a pretty good one, I would say. Um, somebody said, I will drive by the fitness center once a week to pay my respects. That seems more realistic than some of our uh, fitness goals. Uh, somebody revived an old one. This is, I've heard it before, but it said, before I criticize a man, I will walk a mile in his shoes. That way, if he gets angry, he's a mile away and barefoot. So anyway, a lot of different approaches to New Year's resolution, but I wanted to find out a little bit about the history of them. Now, generally, people say it goes back to the days of the Romans. The Romans made New Year's resolutions, and they dedicated them to the god Janus. Janus is the one for whom January is named. So any of you who are thinking about New Year's resolutions, you've got a good excuse not to make them. You can just say, I don't worship pagan gods, so I am not making New Year's resolutions. That's a good excuse. Some people actually say it may go back to the Babylonians. The Babylonians had an interesting thing. Their New Year's resolution was just very simple. This year, I will return something, one thing that I borrowed from somebody. Now, if you went through your book collection, you might discover that that one applies to you. So you, you can be a Babylonian or a Roman. Uh, versions around the globe, I found versions of New Year's resolutions that were used in the medieval knights to increase their commitment to chivalry. The early Methodists practiced New Year's resolutions, and they would have prayer meetings just be, you know, to launch a new year. They said, we don't celebrate Lent, so let's do New Year's resolutions instead. So they had prayer meetings to help people do better in the, in the new era. 
Well, then it was interesting just to look at what people make resolutions in order to do. Of course, it's not too surprising. The number one set of resolutions is about fitness and health. And for people who smoke, they often resolve to stop smoking. People who drink resolve to stop drinking. But more commonly, people resolve to exercise and lose weight. Now, Facebook tells me I need to lose weight. So, you know, anyway, <laughs> go, go figure that one. That, you know, they, they advertise lap band surgery, you know, all the different things they do. But, you know, exercise is very common. Um, there are some ones now in the new era with social media. People re resolve to spend less time on social media. Uh, people resolve that, you know, using computers as an example, this will be the year in which they stop using password as their password or 12345 as their password. And they will actually follow the instructions about those complex things that you're supposed to do. A lot of them are also have to do with family and relationships. I will spend more time with my family. I will do things that will strengthen specific relationships in my life. So those are um, common ones. And a final one I just want to mention is lots of people will have resolutions to get more organized. And that's actually one that, as I'll mention in just a moment, one that actually has a, a certain amount of chance of success. They've also rated the chances of success for different resolutions. But getting organized is actually one that tends to work pretty well because it actually helps you with some of the rest of the things in your life. When the, you know, you're trying to get all the pine needles out of the uh, carpet, get all the Christmas decorations taken down, most people use the term, get the house back to rights. You ever heard that one before? You know, the idea that something was wrong with your house. <laughs> and so, although, you know, what they're talking about, of course, is the, um, the festivities. So really the things that are good about your house. But it's still a little bit out of ordinary. So when you're taking all the stuff down, that tends to be something that works pretty well. Just resolve to get things organized again. Well, let me just give you a few of the pointers that have been discovered by people who actually research New Year's resolutions. What can be helpful? Now, for some people, it's helpful to say, I won't make them at all. Like we mentioned, you, can, you have a good excuse now. Say, I do not worship a Roman god, therefore I will not make New Year's resolutions. But the one thing we know for sure is that the big failure uh, that causes most New Year's resolutions to break down, within two weeks, by the way, most people stop keeping their New Year's resolutions two weeks into the New Year's um, is that the big global ones don't work. Like, for example, the ones, I will be, I will get back, I will get in shape. That's a problem. Or people say, I will lose weight or whatever. But there's actually a lot of research shown about there are ways you can break big global things into small bite-sized pieces. Now, I guess maybe that's not the best illustration for losing weight, bite-sized pieces. <laughs> But, speaking of bite-sized pieces, did you know that if you eat off smaller plates, you eat less? Do you know that if you hide the junk food behind the healthy food, you will eat less of it? There's a lot of different techniques like that. You can say, this will be the year where I'll break it down into some small thing. Like with fitness, too. Um, most people say, I will try to get fit in the new year. So they will join a gym, they will do stuff like that. And joining a gym isn't a bad idea. But just things like... Um, a realistic thing, I will spend at least five to ten minutes walking in the morning. So a small, measurable goal has much greater chances of success than some big global goal. For any goal you have, there are somebody, somebody's done some research on it and figured out some small little goal that you can break it down, you know, some, some steps. We call it baby steps. And it's also uh, sometimes what we call the, the, you know, the, the butterfly effect. You know, they say that every hurricane started with a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere, that some small thing actually can, you know, every big windstorm had to start somewhere. So break it down into tiny little pieces of things you know you can do. Getting organized, that's another one that emerged, that um, just the mere fact of finding some new ways to get organized, you know, saying, okay, New Year's is a good time to kind of clean house, get my closets cleaned out, put stuff in boxes, that's actually one that helps you with the rest of your goals. So good research on that one. One thing I also found interesting is the, um, some, some people recommend making anti-resolutions. 
which instead of saying, well, I, I should do this, I ought to do that, they say, you know, uh, for example, I will stop laying guilt trips on myself. I will stop spending so much time with negative people. I will stop using all these disclaimers that, you know, some of us say, well, I'm sorry about this, is it okay if, you know, just, just act um, w with confidence. So those are ones that, that actually seem to p play out well for some people. But here's the, the one I think is most powerful, is find some way to make some things you want in your life. You know, think about what you actually want your life to be. And there's one recommendation I thought was really helpful. It says don't make a b bunch of resolutions. Just say this will be the year of, with one thing. This will be the year when I travel more. This will be the year of relationships. This will be the year when I learn photography, something I, you know, if somebody says, I've been wanting to get into that for, for a lifetime. This will be the year when I do that one thing. So we actually know that people who say, this will be the year, the year of, and say for every year you want to have one theme that you select and say that theme is going to be something that energizes me, gives me something to look forward to, and I'm going to maybe take a photography class, buy a new camera, you know, whatever it is that would help with that one goal, the year of. And each year it can be something different. Say, this year I will learn this. This year I will focus on that. But kind of having a theme for a year is something that's actually turned out to be helpful. But we also mentioned just the positive fact in general. Something I was, when I was teaching a Sabbath school lesson for Gathering Place, I think a week or two ago, uh, we were talking about Romans 12, and I was looking at all the language used in the lesson to describe the Christian life. And it was kind of burdensome obligation, duty, obedience. I mean, even obedience is good, but, you know, I looked at this whole series of words that was used to describe the Christian life, and it sounded kind of dreary. And then I read from Eugene Peterson his own paraphrase of some of the text from Romans chapter 12. Wow, they sounded positive, enthusiastic. They made the Christian life sound like something you'd actually want to do. So here's the question I would have for you. That do you have this big sense of, well, I ought to do this. I should do that. I must do that. I have an obligation to do that. It sounds dreary and dutiful. It's like an exercise I give my students. And you know, we talk about you know, somebody who comes in to, usually it's the wife to the husband. Honey, we never do date night anymore. Sounds real exciting, right? Say, wow, I want to do that. And I asked them to reword it. If you were in that situation, you were recommending this person a much more compelling, energizing, positive way to say the same thing. What would you come up with? So most of us have things we look forward to, things that energize us, things that excite us. I think one of the biggest problems with typical resolutions is they sound dreary. They sound obligatory, like something you were reminded to do. You know, that, well, you ought to do, you need to do, did you remember to do? You know, like when you walk in the door and somebody said, did you pick up the dry cleaning on your way home? Nothing wrong with picking up the dry cleaning, but that's, if it's always, did you, should you? You know, well, that's not very energizing. So my big encouragement to each one of you is find positive, energizing, compelling ways to frame the things you would like your life to look like when the year ends. Maybe get a big, a vivid picture of you doing something, being someplace, something you say, wow, that energizes me. I want to do that. The Bible is filled with texts about new things. Jesus talks about, about making all things new. We talk about a new covenant, a new creation, different ways of, the Bible is filled with language of newness. So I think there's ways we can channel that, we can harmonize, we can, we can look forward to that. And so the biggest thing is finding ways to make those new things seem compelling and positive. And maybe one resolution, I will find ways to enjoy God this year. Let's take a moment to pray as we prepare to give our offering, a response to the graciousness of God and the new gifts that he gives us every day not just at the beginning of a year.
Lord, we thank you for a chance to respond with gratitude, with offering, but we also thank you for the new year that's approaching. The reminder it gives us of an eternal reality that each day is fresh and new when it's one that is lived for you, committed to you, one in which we live in the newness, the new covenant, the new creation, the reality that all things are new in Jesus Christ. May that be our experience this year to celebrate the newness, to realize that that's something you've already done. We are simply living it out, not trying to create it. Thank you for that gift in Jesus' name. Amen. So before the new year comes, before this year comes to a close, I would like to be vulnerable. And so by being vulnerable, what I'm going to attempt to do is I'm going to share my deepest fear. In my particular area of work, there is nothing that you fear more than having your mind go blank. I don't know if you've had that experience ever. It's terrifying. It's terrifying because you are caught in this space. So whether it's up here as you're delivering a message, 
Or down there as you're greeting someone, there is nothing worse than forgetting what you need to say. Now, most of you know that I have a deep-seated passion for music. You also know that I have not one musical bone in my body. But at my previous church, I had the opportunity one time of directing our choir. And it was on a Sabbath very much like this one. The choir director came and said, Pastor, would you join us up front in this, our last performance of the year? I stepped up to the platform and began to lead the choir in a rendition of Jesus Loves Me. And so at at the start of the whole song, I really began to milk it. I knew this was the last time I was going to get up there. And so I began, Jesus loves me, this I know. And there was feeling, there was passion, there was gravitas. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And then I kind of dragged that last part. And then I picked it up in a crescendo. And continued singing. You know the words, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then as I finished the chorus, fear and terror, because I didn't know what came after that. And my mind was completely blank. And so what do you do at that moment? Well, I started moving and and hoping that somebody would blurt the words out. Nobody did. And so I said, well, I've got to figure out something that goes with the song. So I just put something in there that I thought would match. Away in a manger. (laughs) No place for a bed. Little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The funny thing is the choir followed me. And so people thought it was this wonderful medley but my mind had gone completely blank. It's a terrifying position to be in. What I find interesting about the Christian walk, friends, is that most of us think that this exercise, otherwise known as coming to Christianity, can be approached with a completely blank mind. You don't come to, the, to a conversion experience or to the experience of getting in touch with Jesus as a Lockean tabula rasa or a blank slate. We all have these histories, these stories, these biases, these experiences that frame the way in which we understand the gospel. And the greatest threat to church unity is an inability to recognize that the stories that we have in our backgrounds inform the way that we experience faith. Well, today we conclude our study in the book of Romans. And we do so by once again looking at Paul trying to drag these concepts that are fairly academic and fairly theological into the realm of everyday life. The lesson is aptly entitled Christian Living. But at the outset, Paul wants us to recognize that we had lives before Christ and those lives, broken as they were in form the way in which our encounter with Jesus occurs. This leads to the church being a richly diverse place. And Paul clearly notes that. If you have a Bible, open it with me to the Epistle to the Romans. We're going to focus this morning on the 14th chapter. So Paul begins by saying, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. You see, Paul at the outset, as he begins to conclude his epistle to the Romans, is noticing something. He is recognizing that the church was never meant to be this cozy group of people, of like-minded people. It wasn't supposed to be a club of people who shared the same race or the same social position or the same intellectual 
caliber. Christians are not clones. We are not identical in all respects. And the primary difficult, friends, that the church has always faced is that in our membership, within our community, we have both the rich and the poor. We have both people who are powerful and people who are powerless. We have people from every strata of society. We have old and young, adults and and children, conservatives and radicals. And the key for Christian living isn't how do we weed out those who think different than I do. The key for Christian living, as Paul will note, is how do we include those who think different than I do. So for Paul, this occurs by focusing on two primary groups. Paul's going to refer to them as both the weak and the strong. So the idea is this. Within the church, there are people who are at different levels in their faith development. One of my favorite books, and one of the books that helped me understand this, probably you know, with, a, with a little more nuance, was a James Fowler book, which was published in 1981. Fowler publishes this book called Stages of Faith, and in it, he proposes that there are six primary stages in faith development, and that the difficulty within church structures is that we fail to recognize what particular stage we are in vis-a-vis other people. So let me share quickly with you uh, what these six stages are. Hopefully you'll find yourself in any of these stages, and with the help of Paul, we'll find ways in which to connect with people who are different. So the first stage, according to Fowler, is what he calls the primal stage, or stage zero. Um, This stage is what my baby, my three month old Malachi is dealing with, where faith isn't really a question, uh, rather the search is for a healthy and safe environment. Negative experiences are going to cause him to have a view of the world and therefore a view of faith that is unhealthy, whereas positive experiences will continue to develop trust which will aid him as he moves on to the second stage, which is what Fowler calls the intuitive stage. This uh, is found primarily in, my, in ages three to seven. My other boy, Micah, is going through this. Um, it, is this it has to do with this fluidity of thought patterns. And if, if you can envision this. Religion is learned through experiences and stories and images and people that we come in contact with. So for my, se- for my six-year-old, we do this almost every night. He says, Daddy, tell me a story. And we typically tell him a story about the Bible. And out of that story, he begins to glean a particular religious uh, or faith or ethical principle that he can use. Now, as you continue to move on from this intuitive stage, you now get into what Fowler calls the mythical stage. And the mythical stage all has to do with the issue or the idea that the universe is a just place. In other words, for people who are living in the mythical stage, life is tidy and it's organized and it's neat. And so um, you function with the idea of cause and effect. So you eat your vegetables, you'll be healthy. You don't do what God wants you to do, you'll be punished. And the problem with this particular stage is religion as any other thing, is very heavy with metaphor and symbolism. And during the mythical stage, it's very easy uh, for you to misunderstand the symbolism of the religious experience and just take these symbols literally. So Micah, who's kind of transitioning into this stage, comes up to me uh, last year, last uh, 
April, and he's very concerned. He's very distraught. And he says, Daddy, I don't want to go to communion ever again. And I said, this should be interesting. And he looks at me and he says, no, Daddy, I I can't go to communion again. And I say, why, son? That's when we remember what Jesus did for us. And he says, no, Dad, that's when you eat Jesus. And I'm a vegetarian. And you should be too. The problem with the mythical stage is symbolism is often misunderstood. Now, you laugh because you think, well, that's a, that's a six-year-old. But we, too, often misunderstand symbol, metaphor, and ritual. When, and Paul, by the way, is going to deal with this. The primary stage, if you were to ask me, uh, the, the primary problem that Paul is dealing with in, in Romans 14 is there's a pretty large group of people stuck in the mythical stage that is putting a lot of emphasis on ritual and symbolism. In their case, it's what are we going to eat and what do we do about our sacred days. And the, and the problem that Paul is confronting is that people think that the symbol itself is what mean, what's meaningful or what matters. So as you move From that mythical stage where you misunderstand symbols, you move according to Fowler into what he calls the individuative stage. And this is a stage uh, where you have some angst and some some questions now about religion. You see, um, as you begin to, to deal with these symbols and these ideas and these notions and these metaphors, those metaphors, those ideas create questions. I remember one of my students who was kind of stuck on this asked me a really interesting question. Maybe you can answer it. So I was teaching a class in Introduction to the Old Testament, and we were talking about the book of Genesis, and you have Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve have how many sons? Three, right? And then the Bible says that those sons got married. And my student, who's not an Adventist, who's not a Christian, raises his hand and says, Ah! I say, Yes. Who'd they marry? And I said, Huh? He said, Yeah, who, who did they marry? And I said, ooh, class is over. We, we've got, we'll pick this up next week. And that was the end of the class. You see, you start asking questions not only about your religious experience, but about the text that is fundamental and foundational to your religious experience. And then you move, uh, as you're dealing with this question, you have a, ch- you have a choice to make. You can move either to what, uh, and regress into what Fowler calls the synthetic stage where you see these conflicts and you say, ah, that's too difficult for me, I'm going to ignore them. And you ignore all the conflict. And Fowler says that prime, most people who come to church, most believers, kind of make that decision. They say, okay, we've dealt with the conflicts, we've dealt with the symbolism, we've dealt with the metaphors, we can't resolve them, ergo, we are going to ignore them. And so they do what, you, they do what I did in my class and say, hey, we'll, we'll pick this up next week. The vast minority of us, friends, however, enter into what Fowler calls the conjunctive stage. Where you, where you acknowledge that there is paradox and there is a transcending reality behind the symbols and the inherited systems. In other words, you say, well, the Bible is true even though every single story that is contained in the Bible might not have actually happened in the way that the Bible is describing it happened. So you realize there's a paradox And so you say, the Bible is true in the sense that it tells me something that I need to learn to continue developing faith. So the question isn't, did it it actually happen? The question you ask is, is it aiding me in my faith development? 
So that's stage five. And finally, you move, you move into what mo very few people, according to Fowler, uh, can aspire to, which is uh, stage six, universalizing faith. Uh, some people call this uh, the Enlightenment. And Fowler makes the argument, I think it's a powerful argument, that very few people were able to get into this particular stage. He says, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. Um, the, this particular stage is characterized by a notion from the individual that ultimately what matters isn't religious belief, what matters is people. And so religious belief is useful in the, in the sense that it helps you deal better and more mercifully with other people. So people are viewed with inherent value as part of a universal community and are treated with the universal principle of justice and compassion and love. So kind of keep those six stages in the back of your mind as you think now about what Paul is trying to tell the Roman church, okay? So he says, don't pass judgment on the weak. One person believes he might eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Huh, let me read that again for you vegetarians in the house. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul is actually referring to uh, the pagans or the Gentiles in the church. You see, in the first century, uh, the Jews weren't vegetarians. The vegetarians were the pagans. And the pagans were vegetarian because Seneca, who was a famous, famous uh, Greco-Roman philosopher, talked about the path to enlightenment as being one uh, where you reject self-indulgence. And so Seneca actually becomes a vegetarian. Now, the Jews, um, the Jewish Christians are looking at the Gentiles and saying, wait a second, Gentiles who are eating vegetables, don't you realize that um, this whole argument that you don't want to eat vegetables because they're, some, they're in some case uh, contaminated, means nothing because we are living in this new reality behind the cross of Christ, right? So we don't have to worry about eating food offered to, to idols, which Paul will talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You can eat pretty much anything. And Paul is coming into this argument and saying, wait a second. If one person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let the one, not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed them both. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or fails, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And then he talks about... Holy days. One person esteems one day as better than the other, while, the other, while another esteems all days alike. Each shall be fully convinced in his own mind. And so now he flips the argument, right? Because for the pagans, a way in which you practice discipline was by being vegetarian. For the Jews in the church, how did you practice discipline? Your Sabbath. Your Sabbath was important. The pagans would go to church every single day. And the pagans would say every day matters because every day we celebrate what Jesus has done. The Christian Jews would say, no, no, Sabbath matters. And so they're having this huge conflict in church. And somehow the Adventist church was able to get the weak position and the strong position and meld it together. And we are vegetarians who go to church on Sabbath. And we think that's what matters. And Paul says, that's, that's what matters if you are on step three of your faith development. But you see, Paul isn't interested in having Christians who are on step three of their faith development. Paul is interested in moving us to stage six where people matter. And so you have this conflict in the church. Notice how Paul deals with it. He says, 
Each one should be fully convicted in his own mind. The one who observes a day observes it in the honor of the Lord, and the one who eats eats in the honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains in, go- in the honor of the Lord gives thanks to God. So what is he saying? He says, each one of you should be what? Fully convicted. So he's saying, look, Jewish Christians who are, who are worshiping on Sabbath, good on you. You ought to give primacy to the Sabbath. And then he says, pagan Christians who think that self-indulgence can be fought by being vegetarian, great. The church is big enough to accommodate both views. Do you see what he's doing? He's making the argument that symbols and rituals don't matter all that much in church communities. Why? Because Paul has recognized that symbols and rituals have no value in themselves unless they point towards a greater and grander reality. And he says, the Sabbath is valuable because it points to a grander reality, i.e. the God who made it and created us, and being healthy points to a greater reality, i.e. that same God. So guess what? The church is big enough to accommodate both views. But he doesn't leave it at that. He says, each one of you should be convicted in your own mind, which is to say that the worst thing that we could do is begin to pass judgment on people who observe religion and who experience Christianity in a different way. So not only are you supposed to begrudgingly say, okay, you vegetarian or you non-vegetarian, there's a place for you on church, or oh, you who who come to to church on Sabbath and you who don't, oh, there's a place for you on church, or you who believe that women ought to be pastors and you who believe that women ought not to be pastors, there's a place for you in church. You actually ought to say, this is Paul, this isn't me. I don't want to get a letter. This is Paul. You take it up with Paul. (laughs) Paul is in essence saying the only thing that is truly wrong is if you force people to violate their own conscience. Notice. He's going to make it even more, he's going to make it even clear. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies for, to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So why, verse 10, why do you pass judgment on your brother or, or you? Why do you despise your brother? For it, we will stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as, the, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow. So what's he saying? saying your job isn't to determine who's right and who's wrong. Your job is to continue expanding the sphere for community while allowing for diversity. Now, Christian church has had a long history of this. Christian followers of the great early church patriarch used to say, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. The idea is that we, as Paul sees it, ought to surround each other and to stand firm around certain core beliefs. For Paul, it was clear. It was justification by faith. That's the belief that unites and that we should all have in common. And when Paul sees that being threatened, he will be direct, he will be strong, he will be forceful, he will be clear. Just read the epistle to Galatians. But in all other things, Paul says, what matters ultimately is for us to share, to show 
charity to one another. The great reformer Philip Melanchthon says it like this. He says, in church life and in Christian living, there are going to be certain things which Melanchthon calls a diaphora or things that are on the periphery. He says, healthy churches recognize what things are central to our belief system and what things are periphery. And the problem that churches face, and this, face, and this is him speaking in the 1600s, is when things that are adiaphora are brought to the center because that diminishes the power and the beauty of the gospel, which is about justification. Notice how Paul continues. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love by what you eat. Do not destroy the one from, for whom Christ has died. What's he saying? He's saying people matter more than preference. And the problem is that we sometimes have bought into the idea that what matters is preference. That stuff on the adiaphora. And Paul reminds us that the core of Christian living is People matter. He says, look, if God valued this person so much that he died for them, then why are you going to cause him grief? If this person thinks that the meal that you're eating is unclean, why are you going to eat it in front of them? Why is Paul saying this? In a practical sense, I think it's because Paul is interested in having us realize and recognize that ultimately, within our Christian living, the duty that we have is to exhibit care towards people who are partaking in the same fellowship that we are. And that means respecting their preferences. That means not having them violate their conscience. But more importantly than that, that means taking a moment to hear and understand why it is that they feel a particular way about a particular issue. Because as we started by saying, we, none of us here, is a Lockean tabula rasa. We're, none of us is a blank slate. I have biases that I come to the table with. I have a story that I come to the table with. So before you dismiss me as a crazy conservative or a lunatic liberal, you probably ought to take some time and sit down and listen to the stories that helped me interpret faith in the particular way that I interpret faith. A church that is able to do that is a church that has achieved what Fowler calls that sixth stage in faith development. This is what Paul was trying to do with the church, of Ro with the church in Romans. This is what Paul is still trying to do for us today. He's trying to create a community where we recognize that the primacy and the most value within this particular body is you. It's people. It's not the 28 fundamental beliefs, important as they are. It's not the Sabbath. It's not this building. It's you. That's what Jesus came to die for you. And that's what Paul is trying to push us towards. Let's pray. Lord, the secret to Christian living sometimes begins by taking a moment 
and not focusing on ourselves, our preferences, our ideas, our notions. You push us to recognize that sometimes the most important thing we can do is come to, the, come to a table and listen to other people's stories. Lord, we, we so want to grow into, into Christian maturity. But we recognize that that path is sometimes a painful one. So today, as we traverse it, we would pray that you give us the courage to love well, that you give us the compassion to view people as that, the end of the mission, and that you, by the love that you continue to shower upon us, allow us to view others with care, with love, with mercy. We ask forgiveness for the times in which we haven't done this. It is a difficult task, Lord. And pray that as we kick off this new year, that in our homes, in our workplace, in this church, in Adventism as a whole and in Christendom, you give us the capacity to recognize that because you died, the table is big enough. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.